This is quite a, quite a heavy topic to discuss and think about. Um, and I don't want... Um, I'll explain where I'm going with this, but I want to start off by looking at the birth of the church. So Acts chapter 2, Pentecost is widely considered to be the birth of the church. Let's just see, well, let's just read that. So this is Acts 2, 1 to 4. Um, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. That's, I'm sure you've all heard those verses before. Um, towards the end of chapter 2, it then describes a bit about what the early church looked like. So this is verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings to, and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. That's mad, isn't it? All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Sounds like a good community to be a part of, doesn't it? Could you, ma- could you imagine this living, in, living in, that, in that way? Um. I would suggest that's maybe as close as to restoration that the church has ever got, and it was right at the start. Um, so that's where the church started from. The body of Christ, the bride of Christ, a group of people who were about to change the world, and they did change the world. And since then, the church has done some Im- immeasurable good, led on reforms such as the end of slavery, the abolition of apartheid, and countless humanitarian efforts around the world. Faith-based charities, right at this moment, are providing relief and aid to millions of people around the world. In Keithley, right now, I could list loads of projects run by different churches that are transforming lives and helping people. The church is a wonderful, exciting, powerful and spiritual yet physical body that does God's work on earth. I don't want anyone to think after this message that I'm anti-church or I don't like the church. I love the church. Um, But the church is also a body of humans, like us. And humans make mistakes. Sometimes accidentally, through poor judgment, and sadly often deliberately through greed and power and selfishness. And while the church is the body of Christ, the church is a body of Christ made of humans who make mistakes. And that means that the church makes mistakes. While the churches have a huge positive impact on the society, we also have to recognise that the church has been responsible for a lot of atrocities over the years. Um, To get an understanding of church history, I can't recommend this book enough. Um, The Nearly Infallible History of Christianity. A history of 2,000 years of saints, sinners, idiots, and divinely inspired troublemakers. (laughs) Um, It's it's hilarious, but also also brilliant. Um, There's an extract there, which I'm just going to read to you. It's by a guy called Nick Page. Um, So, this book is a story of how a Mediterranean peasant inspired a movement of followers that eventually became the biggest religion in the world, and of how those followers, who called themselves Christians, did extraordinary, inspirational, world-changing things because they believe that's what the Mediterranean carpenter wanted them to do. That's Jesus. And because somehow he gave them the power to do it. And how even today we're living with the consequences of their actions. And also, how a lot of other people, who also called themselves Christian, did awful, appalling things in the name of Christ. And how, even today, we're living with the consequences of their actions as well. This is a story of some people who tried to live like Jesus, and many people who didn't try very hard to live like Jesus, and a few people who couldn't even be bothered to try at all. The strange thing is, they all called themselves Christians, even though with hindsight it is clear but some of them have very little idea of who Jesus was and what he represented. 
Um, that word couldn't even be bothered. I've, I've edited that word. It was a different word in the book. <laughs> um, from the Crusades to the Spanish Inquisition, and I said earlier that church is instrumental in the ending of slavery. It was also in, in, instrumental in the upholding of slavery for many years. And the church has been responsible for so much indefensible pain. Jesus hated violence. I do not understand how, when if you love your enemies, as Jesus instructed, how can there be such a thing as a holy war? How can you justify that? There was no version of Jesus that would say, oh, actually, now I've heard that. Yeah, forget about turning me over cheek. Go and, go, and, go and kill them all. No version of Jesus would say that. Um, it's not... Um, yeah, and that, sorry, that's without even thinking about sectarian violence between Christians with different theologies, which has caused so much pain and suffering. Again, another quote from this book, Nick Page says, I mean, for Christians, which part of love your enemies is so hard to understand? Where exactly does Jesus say that burning people is perfectly okay? It's not like love your enemies suddenly popped up in some previously undiscovered record of the world of Jesus. It's always been there. And we had different standards back then. Maybe, that may be okay when it comes to personal hygiene, but it does not cut it when we're talking about, burn, talking about one Christian burning another Christian to death just because the second one believes something different about a piece of bread. It, very true, isn't it? What I'm trying to say is the church, because it's human, the church is inherently flawed. I'm talking about this expression of local church that we have here, the global church, and, and everywhere in between. And any church that pretends not to be flawed is lying to you. Um, we try to get things right, but we are human and we make mistakes. If you want to know a secret, even church leaders make mistakes sometimes. I know. What I want to address this morning is the truth that historically... And in today's modern world, the church has caused and is causing lots of hurt and trauma. I want to acknowledge that. I want to identify it as wrong. And I want to think about how we, as a church, can help to deal with that hurt and help people who are dealing with that hurt. Um, I'm no psychological expert on this, but I've done some research and I know many people very close to me have experienced some of the behaviours I'm going to speak about. And sadly, some of those behaviours have been very evident in some previous incantations of this church. Um, and, yeah, I, the number of people I speak to who used to go to church, who used to have a faith, but have been hurt by the church and no longer have a faith is staggering. And it's the elephant in the room, and I want to address that. I want to be open and honest about it and think about how we can ensure that doesn't happen again, and how we can help people who are living with that. Um, I'm trying to break the taboo around discussing this concept in the hope that it will continue to develop the culture of openness and accountability that we, I believe that we have here, so that we don't have any, or minimise any abuses happening here. It's so that anybody listening to this in person or online um, can experience some sense of validation and if anybody's ready, um, if they're ready, they're ready to help try and address that pain. And finally, as I said, to increase the awareness of a little spoken about elephant in the room in church circles. I could name to you several scandals from the last six months of well-known church leaders around the world who have been discovered to not be quite all that they were seen and be abusive, quite frankly, in lots of different ways. Um, but we, all, we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to acknowledge it. It's like a dirty little secret that we don't want to unwrap. And that doesn't help people deal with that. What I don't want this to be, there is a bashing of church leaders and Christians. There are some people who deliberately did things which were, quite frankly, evil. But most people, the only thing they're probably guilty of is failing to consider and question why some of the practices they were promoting or enforcing were in place. Just because it's something that you've always believed doesn't mean that it's right. And we should always be questioning everything. Um, 
The question we have to ask, isn't it, is does what you are doing and acting, does that match a character of the God of love revealed to us by Jesus? I've talked about that plumb line that goes right the way through our lives of the God of love revealed to us by Jesus. Um, it's not an excuse, but a millennia of law, or two millennia of law and religion and people seeking to use the church for their own ends have unfortunately led to this situation we're in now where many things are preached which I do not believe line up with, uh, with who Jesus is and cause a lot of hurt to people. Um, I, having said that, I would never force a victim of abuse to forgive their abusers. That's deeply personal. It's something that can only be done when the victim is ready. But what I do know is that God's love is big enough for him to forgive anybody. And if anybody... I mean, I'm guilty of this to some extent. And there might be people watching online or hear a person who, have, who feel that maybe on reflection they have been the perpetrator of some of the behaviours that I'm going to discuss right now. My message to you in that case will be to reflect. If you can do anything you can to try and make it right, but be confident that the cross was enough to cover every mistake. So, can I give you some examples of what I'm talking about in the modern church? Um, the first and probably the most prevalent one is controlling teaching. So teaching people that Christianity is about a set of moral values and threatening people who don't hold to that standard of moral values with, you're not good enough and you're going to hell. Um, that includes dressing up a set of Victorian Orthodox or Victorian Conservative values as Orthodox Christian teaching, which are not mentioned in the Bible. Things like elevating sexual sins above others. I keep on saying it's not the job of the church to tell people what's right and wrong. Our job is to love people. It is not our job to decide on the moral standards for society. Our job is to love people. Full stop. Can anyone tell me where the Bible talks about sex before marriage? No? Do you know why you can't tell me? Because it's not in there. Yet it's been such a, made to such a huge thing by so many people. Um, it can have, and it's on, this so-called purity culture has had, I know people, this has had a huge negative impact on. People who, because it, it, it gets, the, uh, gets the, to the point where sex is, a, sex is a dirty thing. We can't talk about it, rather than the wonderful gift from God that it is. And it makes people then, and then even when they are married, and still think that they're doing something wrong, or still feel still feel bad about it. Um, I'm not making moral judgments either way. It's not my job to say to make it to make a judgment on that. To put it quite bluntly, people's sex lives are none of my business, um, and it's none of the church's business either. But I just cannot understand why that particular issue has been made such a fuss of throughout the years, and. Just Google purity culture and the harm that has caused so many people. The church business, my business as a church leader, your business as members of the church is to love people. Full stop, no excuses, no exceptions, no small print. I've seen people, seen churches bring people up to the front and publicly humiliate them because of some sexual sin that they're forced to apologise to the whole congregation about. How is that loving? Conversion therapy. Pray the gay away. Again, I'm not here to make moral judgments on anything. That's sexuality. But um, conversion therapy is an abomination that is far too common. Um, it's being outlawed legally for very good reasons. And that has caused so much damage to so many people. Obviously, sexual abuse by people in authority. Absolute abomination. That has been and is still is far too common in Christian circles. Um, misogyny. Teaching women that they are inferior to men by not allowing them into leadership roles or teaching women differently. Again, something that is still very much alive in many churches today. 
Um, this is, I was talking to um, a lady this week about this. Um, blaming for the lack of healing. Making someone think that when someone is ill or when they're not healed, but it's somehow their fault for a lack of faith or some sin that they've committed, it's complete rubbish. I don't know why God answers prayers sometimes and sometimes he doesn't. But what I do know is not our fault when he doesn't. Um, promoting unworthiness. Teaching people they are intrinsically bad or unworthy and that without God, who is obviously gatekept by the church leaders, that they are useless and worthless. Pushing control onto often really vulnerable people. Telling people they have to be something they're not in order to be accepted by God or by the church. And sometimes those things that people are telling people to change aren't something that you can change. And that makes people feel awful. Convincing people that part of who they are is intrinsically wrong. What's our phrase? Judgment. Sorry, not acceptance, not judgment. Loving people. Love is the only mission. Yeah? And then forcing people to forgive people who've hurt them before they're ready. Yeah, we should try and forgive those who have hurt us. But we also need to recognise and deal with the trauma. We should try to forgive people. <laughs> but let me put, put this bluntly. You're not going to go to hell just because you haven't forgiven somebody. You should try to. I could go on. The number of people I speak to who used to go to church and been driven away by things like this are just staggering. Um, these practices and ones like them... Um, and because church represents God, these people often stop believing because they see these abuses as coming from God. They don't believe in God. And the sad thing about that is that then stops them believing in their heavenly identity as children of God. They don't believe in God and that means they lose out on so much. That actually has a name, does this? Um, PTCIS, post-traumatic church-induced trauma. Um, is it, as a subset of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, or sometimes it's called RTS for religious trauma syndrome. And there are counsellors and psych psychologists who have dedicated their lives to treating people who are suffering with this. Um, Do you see abusers are clever? Shaming gets relabeled as convicting. Controlling becomes mentoring. Guilt gets relabeled as repentance. And punishment as discipline. If you've been hurt by the church, I want to say sorry. Like everything pure and good, when a fallen humanity gets its hands on it, it gets corrupted. Often not for any deliberate fault of an individual. Years of human interference, of um, centuries of controlling the masses dressed up as religion and tradition permeates the church. If you've been hurt, what I want to do is validate your hurt. I want to acknowledge it. I want to begin to remove that taboo and I want to make it okay to talk about it. To deal with that hurt, we first need to recognise it exists. There's often a tendency to brush things like this under the carpet. That old ostrich approach, bury your head in the sand and hope it goes away. Often these tendencies come from a good place, a desire not to upset someone or cause scandal. We don't want to bring the church into disrepute. Or perhaps we don't want to open ourselves up to the questioning because there are so many examples of people who have been victims of abuse by the church who when they speak out about it, the church doesn't, isn't sympathetic and doesn't deal with it. The church ostracizes them. It compounds their abuse. It tries to discredit them and makes it worse. So there's no wonder sometimes people don't speak out. So let's put victims first. That's that phrase, isn't it? It's okay not to be okay. It's okay to hurt. Now, I'm not saying you should publicly go and shout about it, but acknowledge it. Talk to someone you trust. Not with that person you talk to maybe have a solution, but... Talking helps. And then once we've acknowledged a trauma, we can begin to process it. How has this affected me? How has it affected my relationship? How has it affected my relationship with God? Now some people say, let's process it so we can put it behind us, so we can forget about it and move on. 
Well, I don't believe that's helpful here because that hurt is part of our stories and part of who we are. Um, I shared the other week, didn't I? Um, I was talking about restoration at a children's event last year and an eight-year-old boy said something really remarkable to me. This is a boy who has been through so much more in his eight years than most adults ever will in their lifetime. And he said to me, Mars, I don't want to be restored to how God made me because what's happened to me has made me who I am. Firstly, what a wise eight-year-old is that? And that question really made me think. The next day I was able to go back to him and I was able to say, I don't believe that God ever makes bad things happen, but he works with us to make good come from those experiences. And when we're fully restored to how God made us, and that will happen even when we die or when Jesus returns, all of the hurt that's been a part of our story on earth will still be there because it contributes to what makes us who we are. But the difference will be that he's healed the bits that hurt and the bits that remain will be the parts that make us stronger. I believe that God can and does heal all kinds of hurt. And I'm certain that when we are restored, we will be fully healed. But for reasons beyond my understanding, sometimes in this life healing happens and sometimes it doesn't. And when healing doesn't happen, like grief, I believe we can learn to live with the hurt. It will be there. It will still surface sometimes and be painful. But we can work with God to focus on the bad, the bad stuff and make us stronger, both in our faith and as a person. So let's think practically. How can we begin to do that? How can we partner with God to begin to heal the hurt? Well, I don't want to minimise this process. I'll say that a simple prayer will fix it. It could, but it usually doesn't. It could be a long process. Maybe one we don't complete until we're restored in heaven. There is certainly not a one-size-fits-all approach to any of this. But what I do kind of have is a toolkit of things that might help. There's a lady called Dr. Alicia Powell, who's a clinical psychologist, experienced in helping people with religious trauma syndrome. And she, on her website, describes some steps for healing. Now, she approaches this from an atheist point of view, assuming the victims have no further interest in God. Um, what I've done is I've adapted these points slightly, using testimony from both second and first hand testimony from people who have been through abuse and have recovered or are on that journey, um, to make some steps where faith doesn't just survive a trauma, but can emerge stronger and is an important part of that healing process. So, dealing with hurt. Firstly, as I've said, we need to be able to acknowledge the hurt and we need to want to try and fix it. And if you're not yet, yeah, that, that's okay. In your own time. When you're ready, God will be ready. And do not go believing any nonsense about your salvation depending on it. The God of love is not sending you to hell. Next, we need to try and separate the false theology from Jesus. Challenge your beliefs. Just because you've always believed or been taught something does not make it correct. Read the words of Jesus, who was all about love, not judgment. Ask yourself, does that teaching line up with Jesus? And if it doesn't, reevaluate it. Explore what you really believe by thinking for yourself. Um, there's a word I did a few years ago called Five Things I Want My Friends to Know About God. Um, find it on YouTube. It's, I'll, I'll, I'll put a link to it online in the comments. Um, yeah, that's why I try to um, encourage a sense of openness, encourage people to want to challenge me if they disagree with things I'm saying. Um, because we, need to, we should be able to do that to everything we hear, no matter who's told you it. Um, third thing is to know that it's not your fault. You are not to blame. You have nothing to feel guilty about. God isn't disappointed in you. He doesn't love you any less. Your pain does not make you any less holy, loved, or worthy. Who is to blame is not important. Who is not to blame is crucial. You are not to blame. Because one of the things about abuse and abusers is they try to convince you that somehow you are to blame for your own abuse. And that is a lie of the enemy. Next point is, the church is not God. The church and the individuals who are part of it were made in God's image, and they often claim to speak for him, but they are not God. It's not fair to blame God for the mistakes of the church. 
Whilst God loves both the abuser and the victim unconditionally, he abhors anything that hurts somebody he loves. And he loves you. However, if it helps you to blame God, he's big enough to take that. He's not going to be, he's not going to be bothered. If it helps you to blame God as you process things, then that's fine. A cornerstone of what I have come to believe about God is that he never makes bad things happen. He doesn't send bad things to teach us a lesson or to test us. There's lots of rubbish teaching about like that. God only makes good things happen. God did not send any abusers to abuse people because you can learn something from it. If it's not love, if it's not good, it's not God. I haven't got time to go into that now, but again, loads of messages that Eileen and I and others have preached over the years online, so check those out. But I think probably the most important part of recovery is learning to see yourself in the way that God sees you. Put away the lens of trauma that shows you a broken, distorted view and see yourself as God sees you. And how does God see you? He sees you as his beautiful child, as the one he loves beyond measure. He sees you as worthy, blameless, holy and redeemed. He sees you as being made in his image to be like him. Learning to see ourselves like that is hard at the best of times, but it's even more difficult when you're suffering. Trauma compounds that even further. Particularly if that trauma was delivered in the name of God. And... Um, have we, have we seen God's love letter online? Uh, Google it. It's a, um, it's a beautiful collection of all the verses in Scripture which so beautifully describe what God truly thinks of you. Um, I might play it at the end, actually. Um, there's a printed letter of it and also an audio recording of it. If you're struggling to see yourself the way God sees you, let's be honest, we all are. Listen to that regularly. Have it on and believe what it tells you. Okay. Community is important. And whilst the church might have hurt you in the past, not all churches are the same. So if you feel able to, find an inclusive, trauma-informed church, as I like to believe that we are here. And some tips on trying to find one of those. If everyone pretends to have no issues, they're lying. <laughs> if everyone, if, if, if no one's hurting, they're hiding it. <laughs> Um, if that's true there's not a culture of walking a real life together as a community it should be avoided speak to the leadership politely tell them something you disagree with them on and see what their response is even if you don't really disagree with it on them and see what their response is to telling, you, telling, the, telling them you disagree with them if they won't listen to you if they're rude, if they're dismissive then avoid it because church leaders should be able to be challenged But I really do believe that being part of an authentic worship community made from imperfect people trying to do their best to love one another and God will help people deal with any sort of trauma. Um, professional help. Treatments like CBT and DBT can be really effective in dealing with trauma. Um, if a trauma has caused a mental health condition, depression, anxiety, etc. Again, don't be afraid to seek medication for that. Some people tell you that getting medical help shows a lack of faith in God healing you. Complete rubbish. Yeah. I believe one of the most important ways God heals us is by inspiring and enabling modern medicine. After all, God works in partnership with humans. I'm not saying you shouldn't pray and we shouldn't be in faith. But don't be afraid to seek medical help as well. And finally, spend some time with God. Be honest with him. Sit down, lie down and say, God, I'm hurting. Help. Cry if it helps. Let him pick you up. Let him wrap you in his arms and let him love you. To finish, let me again apologise. I am sorry to everyone who has suffered abuse by those claiming to represent God. To anyone who feels that they've been abused by the Edel Church Trust in any way, um, I'm sorry. 
Religious trauma is real. It hurts and it's destroyed lives. The church needs to wake up and acknowledge its part in this and work to make it right. However, God is love. And he wants to work with you to help you see yourself as his beloved child, powerful, worthy and beautiful. We might not be there yet, but don't give up on who you are. Not all churches are the same. If you're in a toxic, controlling or abusive church, get out and there are better things out there. That's why our mantra here is this. Judgment, not acceptance, not judgment. Friendship, not isolation. And freedom and not control. Real love. That's why we paid hundreds of pounds to have that on the billboard for a month. Love is the only mission. Pull stop. Should we pray? Father God, I thank you that you are a forgiving God, that you're a loving God. There is nothing too big to be forgiven. I pray for people who have carried out abuse in the past, that they will seek forgiveness for themselves, they will seek to make right what they have done. But I pray for people who have been the victims of religious abuse and church, church trauma that you will help to partner with them to begin to heal that pain, to begin to show them how much you think of them, to reveal your true self to them in of a God of love who thinks they are worthy and valued and accepted just as they are. And I pray for the church as a global institution that you'll help it to wake up to this reality, address it, and do everything it can to help people who are victims. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, I told you we were going deep this morning. And I should, I should just add, if I'm no counsellor, I'm no therapist, but if there is anything that anybody wants to talk to me or Eileen or Wayne Lillian, any members of the leadership team about, um, we're always here and we're always ready to listen. On that note, have a lovely week.